Good afternoon. My name is Samson, who helps coordinate the department's lunch seminar. I really like to welcome everyone, friends and colleagues, and I'd like to acknowledge our future leaders, some of our secondary school people here as well. Uh, today we have a seminar on the dissection of the policy address 2014 uh, by Dr. C.K. Law. And uh, the plan for this uh, seminar is uh, Dr. Law will uh, go forward and to talk about his uh, comments and thoughts on the topic. And the plan is uh, we will leave uh, plenty of time for questions and answers and so uh, pretty much uh, we will go from here. Uh, today's speaker is one of those people I need an any uh, introduction. He's the Associate Professor at the Department of Social Work and also Social Administration. And uh, he holds the role of the Chairperson uh, of the uh, uh, Task Force, the uh, Commission on Poverty. I stop here and pretty much I hand over the stage to uh, Dr. Long. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I call that this uh, presentation the dissection of the policy address. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, well, colleagues, when asking me, uh, to talk about this uh, policy address, they want me to talk a little bit about the inside stories. Uh, so what's inside will be you need to dissect the policy address to tell some of the inside stories. But uh, I have to say, uh, uh, there's not much inside stories I can actually tell in open in this kind of seminar. So, so I will be um, uh, cautious about telling uh, the extent of those inside stories today. But I, I, I will sneak some of those inside stories out. Okay. Uh, oops. The, these are the, the, the focus of my presentation. I'll try to finish it in uh, 30 to 45 minutes and then, and then leave enough room for questions and answers. Um, One of the key issues of this policy address, because it is the second policy address of our chief executive, his popularity rating has always been, has not been high anyway at the very beginning, and has always been on a downward trend. So one of the concerns of the administration in preparing this policy address is, is to see and hope that this particular policy address will be able to regain some of the ground that the chief executive, Sivai Lam, has lost. So, has it? So that's one question. There's high hope and expectations on the poverty, on poverty alleviation, particularly because of the setting up of the Commission on Poverty since December uh, 2012, which is slightly more than a year. So we hope that this policy address will be able to address the issue of poverty. So to what extent? Poverty alleviation uh, is actually can be addressed in this uh, particular policy address. The, uh, the third one is the about the concerns of young adults. For those who have, uh, there are copies of those uh, pamphlets. If you look at the, the the title of the policy address, this time is pretty long. A free focus or free focus, you can say, to support the need. So, which is poverty. Let you flourish, which is, again, one of the key concerns uh, if you look at all the uh, popularity ratings, the group that, that would give uh, Steve Island the lowest rating would be the young people. So gaining the support from young people is a one of the major political concerns. So let you flourish is the second key focus of the policy address. The third one is unleash Hong Kong's potential, which primarily related to economic development, uh, particularly talking about the Land Power Island uh, development in the future, how it performs the linkage between Hong Kong and, and the mainland, which I will not uh, talk uh, much today, unless you, you, you have something to ask. Um, so, whether this particular policy is able 
to address the concerns of young adults is the other topic I'd like to focus on. The last one is about the social welfare sector as, uh, as a associate professor at the Department of Social Work and uh, Social Administration. Uh, in fact, one of our constituency is the social welfare sector. So, and there are some significant elements in this policy address and whether I'm looking at whether this particular policy has actually address the concerns of the social welfare sector. And then quick Q and A, question and answers. I just uh, try to entail some of the headings of the editorials. There, there, there are hundreds of uh, comments from, from the media, particularly the media. It comes from primarily the printed media, the Chinese part in the beginning, and uh, the uh, two of the uh, English uh, uh, newspapers at about. Well, you would expect Man uh, Wei would be very positive, so, so skip that. Dong uh, Fong, <laughs> uh, the Oriental Daily and the Sun Daily, uh, they changed the stance since the change in administration. They have been very harsh to Donald Trump, and they have been very supportive to Sima Okay, So their, their comment seems to be quite positive. Okay? Uh, in the middle, you will find some of the, uh, 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 most of them, uh, uh, sort of quite neutral, some are quite descriptive. When you go to the bottom, like um, the Apple Daily, will be the most, the harshest uh, comment. Okay? But in fact, that is uh, one of the uh, comments I, I, I would say that worth looking into, particularly if you're looking at the political side. Because it said that the, this comment is that the, the, this particular policy stress is trying to can out so as to salvage, so to improve the political uh, rankings of the chief executive. And that it has a long-term negative impact. That was the comment from the Apple State. The Hong Kong standard is quite positive. Even the South China Morning Post, in fact, although it's called pragmatic, it depends. Some people don't like the word pragmatic, but the SCMP, the South China Morning Post uh, editorial has been quite positive. So if you, if you look at the editorial of the newspaper, I, 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 I didn't uh, uh, prepare for you the, the headings of those editorial of the last year or the address. But if you compare that, definitely you will see that from the point of the media, particularly the print media, the, the comment has been quite positive if you compare it to the last year. Well, but the general response is slightly different. Okay. Uh, but if you look at those critical parts, that primarily there are three parts. One is uh, the sustainability of the budget. Okay? Um, on the 15th, on Wednesday, after the announcement policy address, uh, some of the media put all the numbers together, all the numbers in the policy address together, particularly poverty, welfare, etc., and came out with a figure, 20 billion. Okay? Uh, close to the evening, the, the government uh, 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 spokesman uh, tried to clarify, okay? It's not 20 billion. It is basically some of the items are for three years, some of the items are five years, some of the items are actually injection into a fund. So it's kind of a seed money rather than a recurrent spending. So they didn't come up with a, a, a figure from the government side because they have to wait until the uh, the budget, which is will be due at uh, the end of February. So, so basically, the most of the comment, particularly on the first slide, is related to the sustainability of the budget, okay? and uh, believe related to the increase in the current expenses. And some of the critical comments on on that insufficient discussion on the economic aspects. But again, I have to say, uh, if you look at Peter's uh, policy address in the past uh, ten or twenty years. The policy address tends to be a little bit more inclined to the social side, although they are also about the, the macroeconomic aspects. But the economic policy, economic aspects are primarily the focus of the budget speech. Okay, so there's a, 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 a the differentiation between. Uh, and the third, the, I would say, criticism is related to the middle class. I've been listening to all the radio programs or recordings. Uh, and look at what the middle class have to say when they say that the policy agenda has not been addressing to their needs. 
Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't, couldn't find any content in those criticisms. They're only saying that, hey, you're help looking after the poor, and you're not looking after me. And that's it. Okay? There's not much content about what they're really looking for in the policy address. They only say that they are not being addressed. Uh, but if you think about uh, what the middle class probably will need in terms of financial, financial issues, will be like tax rebate. Tax cut, again, that will not be covered in the policy address. They will be again covering the better speech. Wait for it. One and a half month. Okay? And, uh, and you look at the improvement in CY's rating and popularity. The outcome you are uh, uh, opinion poll program. Okay? And uh, just released this result yesterday. You probably have heard on the news. Uh, well, but you look at the details, it's interesting. In fact, in the past 16 years, okay, every time when there's a policy address, the chief executive rating will increase. Okay? Invariably, almost, almost invariably, in the past uh, 16, 17 years, the, the, all the policy address have to improve a little bit, some more, some less, but they mostly help to improve the rating. Okay? Before the policy address, for this policy address, it was increased the rating from 45.6 to 48.9, which is up over 100, okay? Uh, which is, uh, for secondary schools, it's still fail, right? <laughs> 40, 45, 48, it's still fail. But there's a slight increase in the rating after the policy address by uh, uh, 3.1, okay? Which is, uh, uh, that's statistically significant, okay, for those who, who, who are concerned about uh, statistics. And if you look at back at the policy address 2013, in fact, last year, the rate of uh, CY is slightly higher, this, this lower, uh, this year. And again, last year, it was slightly increased, okay, from 48.9 to 52.2. So in both years, the change is 3.3, okay, out of 100. Uh, the net support weight, which is basically those support CY and those uh, 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 do not support it, okay? It, it has been negative ever since, okay? Uh, uh, the last year policy address, it was negative 20%. Uh, and before the policy address this year, it's negative 31%. And the net change is they are both positive. So there are increases in the support or in the rating, okay? Uh, basically means when there's a, whenever there's a less uh, uh, ne negative uh, net support rate, there's an improvement. But there's interesting. The rating of the policy address itself, if you look at it, okay, is a mere pass. Okay, 56.64 last year, 54.1% uh, 54 out of 100 this year. And you look at the net satisfaction rate. It, last year with 11%, it dropped by 6% this year. Although that drop is not statistically significant, but, but you can still see, see that this policy address itself does not help very much. Uh, but, well, I, I like statistics. I, I look into the past uh, 16, 15 years uh, uh, ratings of the policy address. In fact, the the rating of the policy address, about around 90% of the variation can be explained by the rating of the CE itself. Okay? If the CE's rating is high, the policy address will be high. So when the CE's rating is low, the rating of the policy address will be low. May I ask this question? How many of you have actually read the policy address here. Yeah? <laughs> okay, one, two, three. How many of you have listened throughout? Okay, there are more, okay. Well, you don't have much uh, reading habits. Right? <laughs> okay, you can always download the soft copy from the C website. When you do an opinion poll, would you expect the people answering those telephone survey read the policy address? Well, you can say that most of those views will be primarily affected by the media's report, which most people depend on in terms of 
but because people are very busy, so they don't have time to read such a long, long thing and spend two hours to listen to such a lengthy presentation of the civic executive. But again, the variation in the rating of the policy address uh, is very much affected by the rating of the CE himself. Uh, if you look at the statistics in the past years. I'll come back to this uh, political part at the end. The next part is about poverty alleviation. One of the focus, if you read the newspaper today, and actually even yesterday, the focus is on this low-income working family allowance. Okay? Well, let, me, let me repeat it. <laughs> it's a new name, because in the, in the uh, welfare sector particularly, we used to call this one the low income family supplement. Okay, we call it a supplement. Uh, because in Chinese, bo tip is not a very good name. So, so uh, at the end, after the discussion, uh, consider that the word the zheng tip, or allowing, is better. Okay, so, so the name now is called uh, the low income, low income working family allowance. Uh, I don't put the capital letter for those working. Okay, because in short it will be called LIFA or we call it LIFA or LIFA or whatever, okay? They don't have an uh, official pronunciation of that soft form uh, yet, but, but the soft form will be LIFA, okay? Uh, well, I'm not good. if you want to know about the details, I can do that, but in fact you can uh, also, for those that have access to the internet, you can, can look at uh, most of the newspaper today. They have uh, most of the details, uh, the eligibility levels, amount of uh, allowance that the government is uh, proposing, they are all in the newspaper today. Uh, because in yesterday there was a, a briefing to media and the details of the proposal has been spelled out. So unless you really want to ask them, I, I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, the, the annual spending is heavy. How much is $3 billion? Well, it's a lot for us, right? Okay. I'll, 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 I'll look at this $3 billion mirror. Okay. There will be about 200,000 low-income working families. When we say working family, which basically means at least one person working uh, for 144 hours per month. And we expect 700 and 10,000 people will be benefit from the program. Now, how to work out 144 if you're interested? Uh, it's very, uh, because in, in our labor regulations, labor laws, we have a uh, 418 uh, 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 provision, uh, which basically means anyone who works full time uh, in, under a labor law, uh, which is related to like NPF and, and uh, 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 legal protection, etc., you have been being a full-time employee, you work at least 18 hours per week and continuously for four weeks. So for four weeks, 18 hours will be 72, okay? Double that is 144, okay? That's how 144 comes up, okay? Which is very much related to our labor law, okay? So, but no, actually for most people who have to work, like uh, in Hong Kong, the average is around 48 to 49 hours per week. And for each month on average, we have 4.3 weeks. So you 4.3 weeks multiplied by 48, in fact, you get 208 hours per month. Okay? So there's another figure. You, if you read the newspaper today, if you work even higher than, than 208 hours per month, uh, the, the allowance will be higher at a higher level, and below that it would be quite low. Okay. Um, the, again, in fact, if you look at this particular program, the reason we have this low income family allowance coming out from the discussion or the, or, or the policy agenda is very much related to the discussion of the poverty line. On the 28th of September, the official poverty line was announced. Coupled with it is all the analysis of, of the profile of people who are below poverty. For those who are below poverty, take away those who are on welfare, CSSA, 
Comprehensive Social Security Assistance, CSSA, apart from to take away all those on the welfare. For those who are below the poverty line, around 50% of them are working families, which basically means families with somebody working full time. The other 50% are primarily elderly, retired persons. Okay? So if you look at uh, those who are poor, most of them are working family. I was, I'm sorry, about half of them are working families, and about another half will be retirees. And uh, so the retirees is a retirement protection issue. We leave that aside. So the remaining part, if you want to, to help to alleviate poverty, you have to target at working families. The second major finding, I don't put it into PowerPoint, the second major finding is that if you look at what has been done in the past four years and the trends of poverty, Poverty of children stand out clearly, which actually tells us that in the past few years, the policy has been slightly inclined towards the elderly. And yet, for the for poverty in child poverty has been increasing. So, in the analysis of the poverty line and the subsequent profile of people below poverty, two issues stand out increasing child poverty. And there are a lot of working families, not working for long hours, and yet they're poor. So, so the whole discussion focuses on how we're going to help those who are working, low income, and also particularly those who have children. <clears throat> so, so this figure tells you about the thing. This particular proposal reduced the overall poverty rate by 2.1%. But this is an estimate, okay? But at this moment, we're basing on the uh, 2012 figures as the basis for estimation. The reduction is only 2.1 percent. Before government intervention, it, it was 19.6 percent. After taking into the account of cash transfer, that drops to 15.2 percent. That's still the percentage of our population below the poverty line. This program only reduced 2.1%. So is it a big step? Okay, you, 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 this is a very important number. Okay, it drops by only 2.1%. Okay? Uh, for child poverty, it's slightly better. It, it, it reduced it by around 4.4%, but then it was very hard. For child poverty, it was 24.2% before government intervention. And after government cash transfer, it drops to 19.9%. This particular program targets working families, and particularly for those who have children, reduce that poverty rate by 4.4%. Okay? So, so that is the estimated impact of the, this particular program. Uh, by now, uh, for those who are interested about the poverty line thing, uh, you understand that one of the major functions of the poverty line is to help the government to assess the possible impact of its initiatives and later on as a basis of evaluating those poverty alleviation policies. Okay? So this is the, the beginning part of losing the poverty line as a basis of trying to formulate policies and then estimate the possible impact of those policies and later on to evaluate the impact. Okay. Around 38,000 families will be lifted up above the poverty line. Okay, but that's all. Um, oh, by the way, I missed the third bullet. Again, the poverty line doesn't define who would be helped by the government in terms of those policies. It will tell you, well, this should be the focus, but we should not be just helping those who are below the poverty line. For those slightly above them, which they still need some assistance. So in this particular proposed program, uh, you can see it's around 50-50. So around 92,000 families are below the poverty line and 113,000 slightly above the poverty line. Okay. For those who know the poverty line, it is 50% of the median monthly domestic household income. 50%. Okay. So, so that for those who are below the poverty line, meaning those who are below the median monthly domestic household income, 
okay, below 50%. And the program are target those below 60%, including those below 50 and also those below between 50 and 60% of the median uh, monthly domestic household income. Yes. Just a quick question. Do you have a uh, the
what's his interest like at last? Well, at the very beginning, when the government started doing this resource allocation exercise, they, they, they have earmarked this $3 billion for this particular program. Okay? And uh, only until very lately, they realized that this program cannot be launched in this coming financial year. Okay? It's a very late stage. It's around late November. Suddenly, the government realized they can't do it. Because I've been saying that they, they can't do it within 18 months. Right? Because they have to employ hundreds of staff, training, design workflow, and a new computer system, the whole thing. Okay? For government to be able to complete a new initiative of this size, 18 months already would, would have broken all most, most of the government's record already. So they would not be able to spend this money in the coming financial year. And furthermore, we don't know how much time it takes to go through the legislative council finance committee. Okay? Uh, it, it will probably last for a few weeks before the finance uh, committee would pass this particular proposal. Anyway, so, so interesting enough, if you have any contact, communication, discussion with other key policy bureaus, you will know that probably this year they are very generous. In, in, in the resource allocation. And uh, uh, for those who are in uniform groups, any scouts there? Any girl guys, scouts there? <laughs> okay. The fine, the, the, in, a, in, a, in a policy address, actually it has mentioned that the, the amount of money given to uniform group will be double in the next financial year. Double. Okay. On top of that, there are additional resources to support needed family, children uh, joining these uniform groups. So, so they are very generous because they have three, three billion dollars, which are able to be spent this particular financial year, and that is into the resource allocation of the financial year 2015 to 16. Okay, but if you compare three billion to 14.2 billion, it's not a lot of money. Okay, and uh, as compared to old age living allowance, last year the annual recurrent spending is around. $6.3 billion, double that of this particular program. Okay? So in terms of scale, $3 billion within a government spending within the resource allocation exercise is a significant portion, but not a very big one. Okay? So it's not really, uh, uh, in, in terms of long-term implications, because unlike uh, other programs which are related to aging, anything that's related to aging, you would expect that the spending will be keep on increasing because of our aging population. But for this particular program, which is targeted at working families for children, we will not expect much growth in this particular program unless, unless we have more children in the coming years. But uh, no matter how much the government try to encourage fertility, I would say. Uh, they can only manage to reduce the trend of the reducing fertility. That's all they can do. Okay? They can't revitalize the whole fertility rate. Uh, <clears throat> the, this particular program uh, likely will, will reduce the work incentive transport subsidy scheme. Okay? They call it work incentive transport subsidy scheme. And also we expect there will be some Cases transfer from the CSSA uh, low income families under the CSSA system will be transferred to this low income working family supplement because there are a substantial number of CSSA families, they are actually have people working full time and also part time. Um, <clears throat> well, I have to say, in fact, there's no point talking about my recommendation to the government beforehand because it's opposite right now, okay? Uh, but uh, my recommendation to the government, I, I can say that is that it's even more modest than $30 billion. Uh, but that, actually, I would say, my recommendation is to ask the to spend $1 billion each year in the next three years. Okay? One plus one plus one. So it's one, two, three billion to step it up, uh, to be a little bit more cautious because uh, looking at international experience, low income family supplement can have positive and negative impact on labor supply. And we simply don't know what would happen in our farm. 
uh, let, let me explain a little bit about this particular point. The design of this low-income family working supplement will try to design the way to encourage people to work more, and particularly to work full time. Okay. But then the problem, office experience tell us, if you give a family a low-income family supplement, for those who have somebody who's working full time, there is a likelihood the second adult who has been working part time may drop out from the labor market. Because you are given, if you look at newspapers, the amount of money is like, say, 2000 per month. Okay? If there is a part time worker within the family who is earning something like $2,000, $3,000, and now you have a supplement or allowance, their incentive to work reduced substantially. The reason they work part time is to supplement the family income. And now the government is substituting the role of providing that supplement. So there is an obvious evidence internationally when countries in introduce this kind of working family supplement or, or negative income tax kind of arrangement, there is a slight drop of labor supply, particularly among part time workers. We don't know what happened in Hong Kong. Work ethics, uh, the way that people, Hong Kong, Hong Kong people looking at money is different okay? uh, from European or, or American countries. So, so we don't know what happens. So my recommendation is to work on it cautiously and see what happens. In, in, in particular, I, I call this kind of strategy a, a um, in, in Chinese, it's a uh, uh, the way how we can kill a frog by boiling the water slowly. <laughs> so it won't, won't feel the change in the temperature until it's too hot for them to jump out from the water. So, so somehow in, in, in designing this, my, my recommendation is the government to introduce a working family <coughs> supplement slowly. And that will, I would guess, that will do little impact on the labor market. Uh, the concern is because we are low in our labor supply and we were expecting to drop after 2019. Our labor, total labor supply will be dropped. So, so my recommendation has been more modest. But this particular program, I have to say, in fact itself is a very small step. Okay? If you look at the impact on poverty, it's very tiny. Very tiny. It's a very small step already. As I said, if the government can launch the program within 18 months, it will break all the records of the government. So we need some intermediate measures. So in the policy address, it was mentioned uh, that the community care fund will be used. There are two, two, two particular items mentioned in the policy address. One is to find ways to provide additional support to low-income families with children and youth. Uh, at this point of time, I can't tell you what it is, uh, uh, because I haven't told the members of uh, the community care fund task force at this point of time. So I don't want them to read the newspaper to know what this is about, okay? So that would be something, support the community care fund with the gym, trying to provide some additional support for low-income family with children, particularly those who have people who are studying, okay? Particularly those who are studying. Uh, and there's another program uh, in the community, we call it the N-Nothing program, okay? N uh, basically for those who are not receiving CSSA, those who are not on living in public rental housing, okay? To relaunch this program. In fact, this program is ongoing at the present moment. Uh, the deadline of the current program uh, will be the end of August this year. And the administration is uh, suggesting the community care fund to consider relaunch this program later on again at the end of this year, okay? The amount is like 3,500 for single person household, $7,000 for two person household, $10,000 one off for three plus uh, persons per household, okay? So these are the uh, intermediate measures that are mentioned in the policy address. Would there be any other? I, I can't say any more because that is what the policy address has said. So, so these are open, uh, but we were looking at the possibility how we can do something in between before this particular low-income family, working family allowance can be actually launched. Hopefully, in the uh, 2015 to 16 financial year. 
There are other policy alleviation measures measure, uh, mentioned in this policy address, including regularizing certain community care fund programs. I'm not going to go through those details. I would say regular, regularize. Uh, this seven program basically it doesn't mean anything new. It's only transferring the program from the community care fund to the government uh, uh, accounts. Increase subsidized after school care places. Uh, I'm not very sure about how useful would that be. There is a lot of demand for after school care. But then for subsidized after school care program, the utilization rate is only around 85 to 87 percent. Okay, where it's okay. Uh, anything we call food utilization will be around 95 to 97. Never 100, okay? Uh, some exceptions are 103 percent, 105 percent, but, but most of the programs that we never we talk about food utilization, anything over 95 percent utilization is already food utilization. But for the other two here, subsidized places, the utilization rate right now is only 85 to 87 percent. Okay, there, there are uh, reasons, it's logistic reasons that make the utilization rate uh, that low. Uh, I'm not going to draw on the details, but uh, so I'm not very positive about the effectiveness of simply increasing uh, the subsidized uh, uh, other school care places. It will be done by the social welfare department. There's an injection of two, uh, 200 million yen into the partnership fund for the uh, disadvantaged. Uh, the partnership fund for the disadvantaged, well, in short, we call it the, the partnership fund, which basically requires uh, uh, two partners, NGO and the business partner. Okay. The business part contribution can be in kind or in cash. Okay. It can be in kind and cash. And then the, it's a matching fund. Uh, through the partnership fund money, it's in the, in the, um, in the policy address, it mentioned two uh, examples. Uh, one by the Wolf and the other by a group of uh, new uh, foundations, uh, which primarily focus on uh, disadvantaged uh, students. Okay. Uh, one is called the 333, uh, I can't even remember the full name. It's uh, in Chinese, it's Xiu Ling Tao, whatever program. The last for 18 months trying to transform uh, uh, primary school students, motivate them to study. Okay? And the other program they mentioned is the WALK program, which is focused on band free schools, helping disadvantage you to improve their academic uh, standing and the motivation to study. Uh, so the, the whole idea of the country fund is uh, uh, put into this two hundred million dollars to trying to encourage the business sector to participate more in this poverty alleviation program. Okay? Uh, the another injection is three hundred million dollars into the child development fund, uh, which was uh, the child development fund was set up was initiated by the previous commission on poverty back in two o seven. Okay. It was first launched in 2008. Uh, it has been now five years now, and uh, most of the money will be using up in uh, a couple of months' time. So they need to inject $300 million into the child development fund. Uh, and there's also increased funding for school-based programs in supporting low-income family students in other learning experience. The increase is around 25%. Uh, one of the problems of increasing funding to schools is that they are all, whenever you increase funding to schools, there are complaints from teachers. Which means they have to do more because you give them more money, they have to run more, particularly OLE, other learning experience, because which is other learning, which is outside the classroom, meaning the teacher has to work longer hours. And, and so in the project, as I also mentioned, there will be, there will be provide that one additional curricular support to primary schools because the situation in primary school is uh, even it is worse than in, in secondary schools. So the priority is given to the primary school this year, uh, coming year, uh, coming uh, school year will have be increased in, in one curricular assessment to help those schools to to run all this poverty education program, OLE, etc. Et okay? So these are the initiation initiatives. Uh, support for low-income post-secondary students to join overseas exchange in internship programs. Uh, this is a new initiative uh, uh, for the university and any undergraduate students. Uh, 
what one of those uh, problems faced by low income family uh, students in, in university uh, in uh, exchange program, internship, and, uh, and, and those kind of uh, study visits is that particularly most of the internships are happening in the, in the summertime. Okay? The summertime is the time to earn money. Okay? So if they join an internship in the summer, which apart from even like, like this university, we provide all these airfare accommodation uh, for those internships, and yet living expenses are not there, and also they have an opportunity loss of earning during the summertime. I'm not to mention about exchange program for one semester of school year, which is even eaten a lot more in terms of living expenses. So, so this is an initiative to help those low income families, universities to, to join those overseas uh, internship, exchange, and, and study visits. Uh, under the Community Care Fund, there are three initiatives. They are all already called. Are they all announced? Uh, oh yes, they are all announced. Okay. okay. I, I have to double check my, my, my memory is there and now. The hostel grants. Okay. Uh, last year when I was uh, visiting different uh, universities, including Hong Kong U, whenever I talk to uh, students uh, coming from a uh, background like uh, on welfare on CSSA, one of the problems is, is if they don't borrow the government loan. Okay. Most of them will have to work three jobs, four jobs, all the time. And one of the problems is hostel. Because uh, I met a case who studied in Chinese University. He receives $9,000 for their transport subsidy because he lives in Vietnam. So it's from Vietnam. And, and, and it's very generous. The, the transport subsidy for the university is quite generous. It, kept, it assumed that the student had to travel 14 times per week. 14 times, which means from Sunday, from Sunday to, to Friday to, to Saturday, they they will go back to school, okay? And they travel twice. So so the, the, the travel fund is very generous. But once they live in a hostel, the transfer subject is gone, okay? So apart from the high uh, uh, hostel fees, which range from $8,500 to $16,000, okay? It range. Uh, some of the high cost like St. John's College here is more expensive. So, so some of those uh, 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 <clears throat> I swear high from range from eight thousand something to six thousand. So, so that is a major deterrent for low income families uh, who who uh, uh, to, to go to hostel. For those who have been uh, undergraduate education, live in hostel, who could realize that in fact hostel living. It's the place that you build most of your later life friendship, and most important for poverty alleviation, the concept is social capital, <laughs> which is a very important part to build your social capital. But for those who know income funds can join the hostel living, they were unable to enjoy that particular part. So the hostel grant is one thing. Care allowance to low income families taking care of the trail elderly. There's a lot of discussion about whether we just focus on the elderly. Or should we also focus on those time looking after people with disability? Uh, young children, or oh, young children would look after by the low income family uh, uh, allowance uh, for, for the people with disability. My standard answer to the media and to, and to the uh, advocacy group is that uh, the problem of, of disability in Hong Kong is that we do not have a system to define which particular disabled person requires care. We do have a system to assess whether they are they are admissible into dis disabled uh, uh, hostels for the people with disability. But in terms of community care, there's no standardized assessment. Uh, I used to quote example. One of my friend is Zhong Changyao. Zhong Changyao is blind, totally blind. He's disabled, but he doesn't need anybody to care for him. He can look at care of other people, right? So, so that, that our problem with disability, we have close to a million people with disability and we don't have a, a, a standardized instrument. Uh, it's available in this world, but we're not using it in Hong Kong, so we don't have. So uh, my, my, my advice to advocacy group, if you want to commit care fund, to also look after those families who have looking after people with disability, push the government to 
put in into a standardized assessment system. And then I can go for it. And so, so we are going for the elderly. Elderly, we have a standardized assessment process. We have additional grants for low-income students attending self-funded programs. Uh, you all know uh, grants and non. Okay? Grants cover two things. Grants cover school fees and also cover study-related expenses. For, for students joining universities, UGC funding, uh, their school-related expenses uh, in, within the grant ranges from 6000 something to $13,000 per year. Okay? If you study medicine, uh, some of the uh, discipline, they will probably spend about 13000 per year on study-related expenses. But for those who are studying self-funded programs, Companies like uh, self-funded degree program, social degree, they are also able to apply for a grant. There's upper limit for a grant for school tuition fee. I can't remember exactly, but it is should be around uh, sixty-five thousand dollars. Okay, sixty-five thousand dollars is the cap. And also, there they have another four thousand dollars for study related expenses. So there's a gap between those who are studying self-funded program versus those who study in UGC funded programs. Okay? Uh, uh, one of the functions of community care fund is trying to identify those gaps and see how we can fill up the gap. Okay? So one of the uh, uh, initiatives in community care fund is trying to fill that, that, that particular gap. The general response to poverty alleviation program, I got to uh, uh, run fast a little. Okay? Apart from those uh, jealousy type of responses, oh, you're helping the poor, not helping me, that kind of thing. Okay, the kind of jealousy, kind of type of response, mostly a problem, okay, in general. Uh, where it's about sustainability, in general, I dare to say that, but those who worry about that is because they do not understand the resource allocation process, they do not understand the financial management processes within the government, and the implication and significance of that, of that particular, of those programs. Right? There are a lot of misunderstandings. And the response from the welfare sector and FOCK groups are in general quite positive. Okay. Um, I, I received like, uh, a few uh, WhatsApps and, uh, and emails congratulating me about this alleviated program. Uh, I used to say, oh, it, I only play a small part in it. Uh, okay, the next one, the second focus there, okay, you. Higher education is the focus. So we have this, uh, uh, the, the request for the community is about more UTC funded degree places. Okay, the first year, first degree funded places is 15,000 every year. Okay, 15,000. And uh, like last year, uh, DSE graduates were entitled are uh, eligible for the degree program amounts to 78,000. Okay, and uh, and the number of first year first degree is only fifteen thousand. In fact, some of those places are used to uh, to to admit non jupiter students. We call non jupiter basically means non DSE students. Okay? So so there's a big gap. There's nothing in this policy address addressing this particular gap. I can tell you the reason. The reason is very simple, because by twenty twenty two, all those who are eligible under the DSE, will be able to get a, a fund, UTC funded degree program. For those who have fulfilled that degree eligibility, 3322, okay? The grades, 3322. If they fulfill that requirement, all of them will be able to get a place without increasing the number of places from now to 2022, okay? Because of the strengthening population of our young people. Uh, very, very, very simple in the record. Tech. In 204, we start to, well, we used to kill, say kill primary schools, okay? We shut down primary schools starting from year 2004. Six years later, 2010, we, we shut down classes in secondary schools, okay? So six years later, 2016, we'll be shutting down programs in post-secondary education. In fact, it has already started cutting them. Two vocational training has closed down already in the past year. 
Okay? So we'll expect more closing down of vocational training institutes and also associate degrees which are not professional related and they will be shutting down in the coming few years. So the problem is that we've been, the government has been encouraging uh, institutions to increase their self-funded program in terms of associate and also self-funded degree programs. But then we are already starting to reduce the numbers, okay, particularly because of the trending. For those who are coming uh, uh, to universities in the year 2022, don't worry. Okay? You get 352, you got a UCC funded program. <laughs> degree program. So that is the reason that this administration hesitates to deal with this problem right now because it is a roller coaster. Okay? There will be a slight increase in 2023, but then by the year 20, 2031, there will be a cliff drop in terms of student numbers. Okay? So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very big challenge for our uh, administration in terms of our education system because of the roller coaster of our student numbers. Okay? Loans. Okay? This is one of the biggest problems young people keep talking about is the government loan. Okay? A lot of student, uh, graduates say, uh, well, we call them in Cantonese, okay? they have a lot of government loans, and we pay them for 15 years. And, uh, and that is a psychological and financial burden. And that is, well, for, for there are research actually, not in Hong Kong, actually telling people that for those graduates who have student loans, they tend to marry later. <laughs> okay, and uh, which means a drop in fertility too. So, so, so if you can reduce the, the, the burden on loans, you can increase marriage rate and also fertility rate. Uh, there's a public policy issue. In our case, I'm talking about how to reform our loan system uh, so that uh, the repayment of loans should be commensurate with the salary that you earn. So that reduces what we call an investment risk, particularly for low-income families. Uh, but anyway, the government is not taking that into account. But that they will be looking at it again in the coming year, how to reform the loan system. Uh, you know, you know, finance institutions are very good in in restructuring of loans, right? Anyone have uh, used those services to restructure your loans, uh, credit cards, and uh, that sort of thing? And so uh, the government is looking at how to help. Uh, 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 low-income young people have a lot of government loans. How to help them to restructure the loans to reduce the burden? Okay, but that is a very technical and difficult task. But anyway, the government is trying to do that. Overseas studies, exchanges, internship is a new initiative. The hotel grant. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's hostel grant. Oh, uh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, uh, hotel grant. That's good. Uh, but, uh, I mean, hostel grant. Uh, more grants for self-funded programs, okay? Uh, and, and that is an, an additional. Uh, for young people for work, there's allowance for attending vocational training and joining an apprentice. Uh, I used to say apprentice. But anyway, there's apprentice programs in uh, designated industries and trades which have a severe shortfall of labor. Okay? One of the examples you mentioned is uh, lift maintenance. Okay? There, there are almost like 11 industries they're talking about in terms of trade industries that they're targeted those industries that are difficult to recruit uh, young people so there is allowance this program mirror the uh, construction uh, uh, workers training program for those who join those construction uh, industry uh, training vocational training program they're given $8,000 per month during the training and an additional a supplement for their income after they join the, the in industry. Okay, so this particular program will mirror, not as generous as the, uh, the construction uh, 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 industry program, but will be uh, uh, something here like uh, uh, that, that kind of arrangement. Housing. Well, the uh, youth hostel thing is a, it's not a new thing. It's just uh, telling us that the, the materialize some of one of the earlier initiatives by Dong Zhang. Okay, so young people, well, I'll leave it to judge whether young people 
we feel that this whole this particular process right, actually let you flourish. Okay? <coughs> I would say it's quite limited, okay? But but you can see the efforts and the, the focus that this process is trying to achieve. For the social welfare sector, there are four main concerns. One is retirement protection. Of course, the address said that uh, by the middle of this year, I'm not sure whether they said by the middle of this year, but, but anyway, according to Nelson Zell, it's by the middle of this year. Uh, Nelson Zell will be uh, 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 finishing the study on, uh, on different proposal on uh, retirement protection. There are immediate and long-term financial implications and other considerations. The re study report will be to be finished by uh, the middle of this year. So after that, there will be a series of community engagement process to engage the community to discuss the directions ahead. So community engagement process will start uh, by the next half of this uh, particular year. And uh, it is will be work under the elderly commission. Okay. Uh, the, the other concern is poverty alleviation. We have mentioned a lot of them. Uh, Long-term planning and also the lump sum grant, which is we the, talk about the uh, subvention system, the lump sum grant. Uh, in terms of long-term planning, uh, in the welfare sector, we call this uh, EPP, which basically means LD program plan. Okay? Uh, in the government, EPP stands for Enhanced Productivity Program, which basically means reduction of budget. Uh, <laughs> So it's not a very good term uh, within the government. Uh, but uh, under the long-term planning, there will be an elderly program plan. The process uh, will be, uh, but that will require a engagement process of the community, not just the social welfare sector, but people in the community, all stakeholders who are concerned about aging in our society will be involved in this process of planning of elderly service in the years to come. Uh, there's no commitment for planning of any other types of service. Uh, currently, uh, in rehabilitation <coughs> services, we do have a rehabilitation program plan. But I have to say, this is called a plan, but it doesn't have a plan. It only have directions. It doesn't have a plan. A plan means you have dates, targets, etc. It doesn't have dates, no timelines, and no targets. So I, I would say it's a rehabilitation program strategy or directions, okay? It can, cannot be called a plan. But the LD program plan is an important part. Uh, and it is uh, because uh, in the policy address you mentioned, there is a special site scheme trying to encourage NGOs to use their sites to be develop their premises to make better use of land to increase the supply of service units. Uh, there are around 63 proposals coming from 41 NGOs. Okay? And uh, one of the programs received a lot of publicity, which is the Bok Hoi Hospital, hospital uh, in Lang Bay, close to Lang Nam. They are planning to provide 2,000 places for LD residential care, and which basically require 1,000 care workers, 6,000 nurses, and 3,000, uh, sorry, 600 nurses, 300 uh, uh, occupation and physiotherapists. And I guarantee there will not be enough supply of nurses, <laughs> occupational therapists, and physiotherapists in the coming 10 years because of that scale. So to do a program plan as soon as possible and look at how we look at the hardware, software and humanware is a key thing. Otherwise, even if they find enough premises to build enough residential service for the elderly or people with disability, we don't have people to staff them. Okay? At the current moment, the vacancy rate for nurses in substantial service in elderly is around 20 something percent. Vacancy rate for occupation and Physiotherapy is around 30%. Vacancy rate for personal care workers is around 12%. Okay? They have very high vacancy rate. They can't recruit at the present moment. Uh, lump sum grant. Uh, the key concerns of the NGOs relate to uh, support for administration and supervision. 
Uh, yes, in this policy address, it was addressed. But whether that is adequate is another issue. Uh, the NGOs are talking right now that they should need a mechanism to revise that particular level of subvention. Instead of, uh, the last time the government increased that subvention was 22008, okay, five years ago, and this increase is basically arbitrary. Uh, the other one is adjustment of other charges. This is a little bit technical. Uh, the other charges referring any other things apart from salaries. It's called other charges. Uh, in a government budgeting process, they have two factors. One is related to personnel, which is salary. The other is other charges. The government have a, what we call a government inflator to estimate those things for budgeting purposes. But unfortunately, because the NGO subvention is based on the government inflation factor, but NGOs have particular like residential service, day service, they have, they spend a lot of money on food. But the government inflator doesn't include any item which is called food. And, but food has been, the price of food has been increased very drastically, okay, a few years ago. And you compare like past five years, the, it is much higher than the general inflation. So the, uh, there's a problem in the uh, inflator of the adjustment of other charges. The uh, adequacy of the benchmark, uh, NGOs are given a lump sum. The lump sum is based on two components, the other charges and the salary. The salary has a benchmark, which basically is equivalent to the midpoint salary of government, of government ranks. Okay? And uh, NGOs has been calling a review of that particular principle on the adequacy of that benchmark. There's no response on this particular part. Okay. Uh, there's no subvent there, uh, there's additional thing for subvention for employing paramedical staff, nurse, occupational therapy, physiotherapist, <coughs> dish therapists. Uh, the reasons they have to increase the salary so that they can compete with the hospital authority. But anyway, there's not enough out there in the market anyway. But but to give extra money to NGOs to give them a little bit leverage so that able to compete with other uh, uh, demands. Okay? Uh, but this is not new results. The, in the past two years, there have been money coming from the Wall Street Fund to fund this additional uh, service. And now it's becoming regularized, becoming a regular government subvention. Uh, response from the welfare sector, Chen Bokshu. Okay. Uh, no news, new, no new newspaper have, uh, have uh, quoted him uh, at this time. So I asked Chen Bokshu to send me his. Uh, <laughs> His uh, uh, press release, and uh, and uh, after reading it, I would say if I'm a reporter, I would not report it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but basically, uh, the the press release is just saying what the government has not done, has not uh, uh, included in this policy address. It is a very uh, common behavior of particular people in the welfare sector when they see there is something that the government has said. So they, they will look at what the government has not said. Okay? They have not said. And, and, and so uh, they, they, they have a long list of requests. Uh, let's say the government take uh, like 30%. They, they would not mention the 30%. They would not even acknowledge the 30%. They would just talk about the 70%. Okay? That's what Zheng Goji has said. And so there's no quote about Zheng Goji. There's some quote from Choi Oi Wai, the, the new. Uh, 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 Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Council of Civil Service, uh, because he has some acknowledgement of what the policy address has addressed, and and yet uh, most part of it, the uh, of the, the, the press release is uh, on what the sector wants, but yet the government has not responded. Uh, let me quickly finish. Okay, just three points. Okay. Uh, if you look at the context of the policy address. You can say that, in fact, this time is, uh, this policy address is trying to be quite scientific. Which basically means, in drawing up this policy address, they do a lot of survey, okay, to look at what are the concerns of the public, and try to give proportional sort of efforts for those survey results. And so they, they're trying to address something that the public has been saying before the policy address. Okay? If you look at the content, you're going to say mostly they're trying to address what they have done in their own service. 
and trying to respond to those demands from the community. Unfortunately, the media and the public will focus on what it does not address. So the chief executive has his policy address. The media will have the policy not addressed. Okay? <laughs> we talk about what the policy address has not addressed. And politically, if you look at all those things, Sea Island has achieved very little with respect to popularity, except among grassroots. If you look in general, there's hardly any gain. And if you look at the pattern of changes in rating, it basically does the average of the past policy address can, can do to increase the popularity of the respective city sector. So that's all it has achieved in this particular concept. I want to end here because uh, I'm sorry, I overrun. Uh, so I, I leave it to you. I have. Uh, we have 15 minutes, I'm sorry. That's just a lot more time. There's a problem of, 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 uh, of professors who would like to talk to you on time. Any questions? Yes, I see a hand. Raise your hand if you want to raise a question or comment on the time. Hi, um, I'm Holly Bonham. I, I just want, you mentioned that um, the, uh, the policy addressing is really scientific in you know coming up with um, you know, solutions, but how about, you know, the implementation I see in the policy agenda, and I assume that those are written out by the bureaus as opposed to written out by, you know, the, C, uh, the CE and the CS. Um, particularly, I think for us, it's the ethnic minority education issue. There's a great disparity between the two. And for you, uh, from your perspective, what do you think is, um, um, that can be done, maybe, um, uh, so that the implementation really achieves the goal that now the is setting up. Well, to answer your question, I would have to predict. Yeah, well, for the year education, I think. Well, on, on the ethnic minority, uh, one of the focus of the policy address is on uh, Chinese as a second language. Uh, the, the administration has always tried to avoid that particular term, Chinese as a second language. But uh, at the end of the day, they were considered as politically correct to use the term Chinese as a second language. So the policy address used that particular term. Uh, the whole idea is that, uh, well, let me, let me see if I can uh, cut it short. Uh, the problem, we have a lot of problems in our existing system for ethnic minority in learning Chinese. And uh, one of the reasons of that, one of the major elements of that failure is due to there's a so-called uh, designated school. Okay? Designated schools are those schools that receive additional subsidy from the Education Bureau because they have admit a large number of ethnic minorities. Uh, designated school is not official term. Okay? We call it designated schools simply because uh, for ethnic minority, they consider those schools are the schools that they should go to. This is a general misunderstanding. Uh, the, one of my, the, 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 the schools, uh, my, when I was uh, the, studying primary school days, the primary school now become a designated school. And <laughs> uh, now they have uh, over 90% ethnic minority in, uh, in, in, in primary one, and uh, around 50% ethnic minority in, uh, in, uh, in grade six. Anyway, uh, is that, that there's a lot of problem because of this arrangement. And the second issue is the lack of benchmarks of Chinese uh, efficacy in terms of the proficiency. And, and so the, the education bureau now, I think it's a very challenging job. And I'm not sure to answer that question of implementation. It is trying to devise mechanisms, standards, assessment instruments and curriculums and also uh, learning uh, uh, material to couple with different levels, okay? So that it requires a lot of training of teachers and also to help them to change that particular attitude that they have to go to destiny schools. And also uh, at the end, which is the DSE level, they have to uh, put in a new arrangement so that the students can be able to achieve certain level which at least they can join the civil service. Okay? Uh, there's a class that's called 
applied studies. And so there will be one new applied studies for DSC, which is related to Chinese as a applied study, which is a working language for Chinese. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the implementation thing, but I can see a lot of challenges, particularly because it involves so many schools and the administration, and, uh, and this is not a good time to implement this program when the, there is a reducing number of students going into secondary school. Southern schools are worried they are unable to recruit sufficient students, so they rather admit ethnic minority students. So, so the, now it's, uh, it's not a very good time, specifically, and uh, the whole thing is new. And uh, the uh, applying studies, and uh, I am not sure that, that, that it received uh, sufficient support from the education sector, but the implementation is, I can say it's a big challenge. I'm not very optimistic about that, and I have no remedy. Uh, because I can see the complexity of interaction of behavior of parents, teachers, principals, and students. And uh, I, I can't say more because it would take another 30 minutes to talk about the complexity of that problem. And, and the solution is, I, I, I don't think we have a solution yet, but, but, the, but I would say the direction is the only thing that right now the administration is able to think of at the present moment. Okay, any any. Um, I have a quick question about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the working family uh, allowance. Um, in essence, it's actually similar to the minimum wage, in the sense that both are trying to do the same thing, uh, except um, one place the burden on the private employer. employer. One, uh, let's not say the word, one is the funding come from private employers who employ those people. But these allowances actually come from the general tax uh, government revenue, which in indirectly come from the society and everyone, everyone share the burden, right? So does it mean, um, do you see that one day this program actually can um, set, uh, replace the need for more uh, effort on the minimum wage fund? In the sense that if society care about all these people who work but are still poor, then why not society share the burden so place that on the individual small, uh, let's forget about a big employers, but the small employers who actually have to show okay. uh, Let me explain it uh, somehow slightly indirectly. Uh, in the design of this uh, uh, low income family uh, working allowance, working family allowance, uh, the idea is to only target two person households. Okay? Single person household has someone working a single person who is working. This allowance, if applied to single persons, households, it will basically mean a wage subsidy. It is a working family sub subsidy or allowance. Okay? It's targeted at a family. Theoretically, just imagine, we have textbook allowance, right? Students receiving textbook allowance, super junkie. Will the employer cut the salary because the employee have a child studying in primary and secondary schools and they have an increase in tech allowance? No. Okay. So basically salary and family-based allowance, have, we, we don't have any empirical evidence to say that if you increase family allowance, then reduce the incentive of employers to increase the or, or uh, induce an incentive for them to cut. Uh, 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 Series. Uh, so the design is trying to avoid a coalition of, of this particular policy, a conflict between this policy and the statutory minimum wage. The objective is not to interfere with that process of determining the statutory minimum wage and also the market rate. Okay? So the whole idea is whenever it's a family day thing, it is very difficult to target on salaries, which is an individual base. Okay? And salaries are based on market situation most of the time for the private sector. So it's a demand and supply issue. More than how much the employees have earned in the family, back in the family. Okay? The employer won't give you extra salary because you have a poor family. The employer would not cut your salary simply because you are home alone. Okay? So, so family allowance will have 
we have no theoretical and empirical data saying that uh, 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 family based allowance will have an impact on salary within the labor market. Not to say about the impact on the negotiation between the employer and employee sector during the process of negotiating the statutory minimum wage. Okay? There are some speculations, but I, I don't find any evidence so far. And uh, I, I, I can't conceptually imagine our employer will be, uh, will increase salary because you have a big family, or cut your salary because your your child has a, a textbook allowance. Okay, so so I don't think that should be a uh, decision. It doesn't go into the factor of decision in terms of salary decision in the labor market situation. Uh, let me let me let me. Uh, uh, question, and it's related to the sustainability question. Uh, I think um, the, the media or the public concern about sustain sustainability uh, may not be entirely uh, you know, due to understanding. Uh, well, true that um, this new um, life scheme is only um, distributed uh, annually, and it's only 1% uh, of the um, total government's uh, uh, recurrent expenditure. Um, but you know, if you look at the main power editorial today, it also puts some unrelevant figures. Like uh, you know, for the past two years since uh, Sui Leung uh, taking over the office, the ex increases in uh, welfare expenditure has already uh, you know increased by 38 percent, and that compared with 28 uh, percent for the Donald uh, Trump's um, you know uh, administration uh, for 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 a total of seven seven years. So that's a lot of money. Um, of course, on the revenue side, um, the government's um, kind of medium range um, forecast of 4% real growth every year. Um, my own experience in the government and also at the HKMA uh, has been that, um, you know, that medium range forecast was more reliable and predictable in the 1970s and 1980s, when Hong Kong's economy was kind of more, uh, kind of a developing economy, economy mode. Um, but since 1990s, uh, when Hong Kong's economy has been transformed into a you know, service-based economy, it's been more volatile and very success successful to uh, external growth, external sector, and also the public market. So if we look at the experience in the 1997-1978, uh, because of the decline in the public market and the service sector, the government's revenue has dropped substantially by over 50%. And that has immediately resulted in uh, fiscal deficits for four consecutive years. So um, if we look at the track, uh, what I mean is the track record of the government <coughs> in predicting the medium range forecast has not been very good for the past 20 years. And that's why you know the financial secretaries, no matter if it's Donald Zhang or uh, you know um, this, the current financial secretary, they've not been very good at, at uh, estimating the, the revenue and the no, no one has done it. Yeah. So um, I, th I think my main point or my main comment is well, what's been proposed in the policy address. Uh, all these are worth doing and they are badly needed. You know, we, we need to do something to help the, the working poverty people and also the, uh, the child poverty rate. Um, but at the same time, the government really need to do a more rigorous analysis on the revenue side. To understand that they also need to think about reforming the, you know, the, the very narrow tax base at the moment. Uh, going forward, we still have a lot more to do on the uh, elderly um, problem, uh, aging population, uh, retirement protection. Uh, we, we all need to, to, to launch new programs. But we need to make sure that we have a sustainable basis for doing that. And reforming of the fiscal reform, uh, fiscal system, the tax, very narrow tax uh, based regime now, uh, is also another power task for government. Uh, so as to be sure that we have a sustainable basis for doing what we need in the future. Let, let me give you a very, very quick response. First yeah, please. Yes. I think you only allow two more minutes. <laughs> We've been talking about tax reform in the past 20 years without any single improvement. Okay? We've been talking about tax reform in the past 20 years. Not a single inch. <laughs> Secondly, well, yes, we have a strength in really Predicting and shrinking labor force starting from 2019. But that strength is uh, less than in the next 20 years, is less than 1%. It's less than 1%. Okay. 
And that less than 1%, if you're talking about the productivity gain that we have achieved in the past 20 years, and we expect more or less slightly lower, but more or less the same productivity gain, we'll be still expecting a long-run economic growth. Okay? That's my prediction. I can answer quickly. Uh, with a, a long run, well, that will be the downs and ups. We all know the, those fluctuations in the economic cycle. Uh, but in the long run, we will expect, even if we cannot solve the problem of uh, labor force uh, uh, strengthening in, 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 in the next two decades, we will still be have a slightly increase in, uh, in, our, in our GDP. But that which basically means, because this particular new inertia only capture a very small part of the growth of this year, okay, in the coming year. But that will stay put. Well, it will slightly increase, but that will, that will not be significant increase in the coming year. So if you look at, if you draw graphs, okay, so this will not like a crossing, one it will be increasing very rapidly, one will be a stay put. All we can say is that in the years to come, when we have a slow economic growth, the capacity to have new initiative will be more and more limited. But it doesn't mean in the future years we will not be able to provide the service at the present level the government is providing. Because we're still expecting a slight growth, the economic growth, although it's lower, the economic growth. And yet we'll be able to sustain the current level. But the ability to improve it will be reducing the future. I was just wondering for the uh, working family and poor, um, what is kind of the ideal percentage that they're, they're looking for um, as acceptable? Okay, getting you know, getting rid of it completely okay, but um, has it been regenerating itself? For example, working family poor, next generation working family poor, over, I don't know the statistics over the years. So I'm just wondering, what has this policy done that's, that's going to, to change something significantly from previous years if, if families keep on at that rate, regenerating working poor family, working poor family? This, this is a tough question because uh, the outlook in the future for uh, social mobility is not high uh, because we have we will be expecting a slow economic growth and uh, and because of our democratic structure uh, the biggest bulk of people uh, our baby boomer is around 50 to 54 okay they still have uh, they can't retire in 60 so they can only retire in 65 even 68 so so basically opportunities for development for younger generations so in terms of families, because of the, the general outlook for social mobility, because of lower economic growth, and also of a demographic structure, then social mobility for poor families, the outlook is, uh, I would say, quite pessimistic. Uh, what we can do is try to reduce those uh, macro factors impact on, on intergenerational poverty. So we will never be able to make those opportunities for development for poor family children to be like that as rich families. But we try to reduce the gap. That's all we can try to do. Uh, we can never make it equal, in terms, even in terms of equal opportunity. Uh, the difference in financial assets, the difference in social capital, uh, is the, 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 the gap is very huge. And we try to reduce it. And uh, so I can only say that in the decades to come, uh, with what the existing uh, 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 efforts in terms of do, uh, trying to reduce intergeneration poverty is trying to invest as much as we can, uh, as we can allow in within our constraints in administration and financial constraints to put it more on education. And this year, the, the effort is trying to do that. Uh, unfortunately, as I said earlier on, our education bureau and our education system is being very tied up with this uh, fluctuation in student numbers, quantities, numbers being, becoming the biggest problem rather than quality of education. And, uh, uh, and bureau, bureaucrats are spending almost day and night working on numbers rather than quality. And, uh, 
So I would say is the uh, our, our problem is immense, and uh, what we all can do is keep on pushing the government to do a little bit more and a little bit more to make it more equal and people have more equal opportunity. And uh, we require that's why that injection money into the partnership fund is trying to encourage the business sector to step in more uh, new initiatives, new ideas, innovations, so that we can help uh, uh, the disadvantaged students to catch up. And, uh, and, and so to reduce that issue about the generation problem. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Law, for putting your uh, seminar together and also your insights. Shall we put our hands together? <laughs> some background about CK. CK has an undergraduate uh, degree in economics and statistics. And then he worked in a bank for two years uh, before he came back to Hong Kong to do the center study. So you can see that it is a combination of numbers and where to get money and how to translate it into good policies and programs. And uh, CK not only has he been helping the government, he was also advocating he was telling me that we have to do something about students who can't, couldn't afford um, going to university and uh, tied up with so many jobs um, and have no time to build a social network, which is so important for the lifetime asset for them. So um, being persuaded by him, uh, for instance, I think uh, waiting for the government to be doing something is correct. But at the same time, all of us in our own capacity can be doing things that we think are right and need to be done. For instance, uh, in our department, we this year we started giving our bursaries to students on well, bachelor of social work uh, students. Uh, we gave up 40 bursaries to four-year students, um, about 10 students each in each class for $24,000 a year, about $2,000 a month so that they would have money to spend without being tied down with finding jobs if they are financially tied. And uh, we also encourage students, uh, bright students like CK, uh, to come into social work. Uh, and we offer a um, $60,000 scholarship for people who are interested in making a difference to go into social work uh, based on the DSE results. So if you're interested, there are flyers of our department and uh, booklets and things like this that you will be, we can get and learn about. But more importantly is, I think all of us can make a difference. All of us can make a difference by um, doing our own roles well, but at the same time being caring to the community. So um, the better society relies on all of us. Thank you, CK. Thank you. Thank you.